or a can of Schlitz. Can you even <laughs> buy Schlitz, uh, William? I don't now? know. Can you even get that anymore? Uh, no, we'll <laughs> unless you find it on eBay mind. somewhere. Fifty year old reference to the Midwest and the land of <laughs> You are from the Midwest, right? From Illinois. Great. Uh, before I turn it over to Chris, who will go over a few things with us and then turn it over to William for the tonight's feature talk, I wanted to remind everybody, and I'm sure many of you have heard this a lot throughout the course of the conference, but just remind you how to ask questions and be involved in today's program. Um, raising your hand allows you to alert me that you're interested in asking a question or even just having a discussion with the rest of uh, us here today. Um, if I see you raise your hand, I can immediately cue you up for a question and enable your microphone. You will see a warning pop up when I enable your microphone that says the host would like to unmute your microphone. Once you accept, your microphone will be enabled and you may ask a question. There's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. I see many of you are already using it. So feel free, feel free to let us know where you are, what you're thinking, what kind of drink you have. We'd like to hear it all. Um, you can use that chat box throughout the course of the presentation if you'd like. If you have a question at any time, you can click, a, uh, you can click on the Q&A button and ask your question. Speakers will either answer your question by typing in a response or William will address it at the end of his presentation. Um, all sessions will be automatically closed captioned for those of you who would like access to the live closed captioning of the session. You would simply click the closed caption button to view the real-time text transcript of today's session. Uh, sessions are available as a recording within one week of today's session. You will receive details on the session recording by email. Please add us to your safe senders list from your email client if you want to ensure these messages don't end up in your junk mail folder because that would be wicked. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> moving into uh, the next, uh, well, I'm going to introduce Christine French, our Director of Marketing and Communications. Yes, um, I wanted to just say, you can stop sharing your screen if you want, John. Okay, here we go. Uh, and we're, we're also on Facebook Live at uh, CA Preservation. <laughs> Sorry, I got people in the kitchen back here. Um, I wanted to say hi to some of our friends. I see George Smart is calling in from uh, North Carolina. And Kitty is, says, where's the recipe for Wicked Sacramento? So we had a special drink for one of our other um, sessions. And I think the special drink should be the one that I made. It's my Grey Goose. And then William has suggested that uh, you just drink straight whiskey. So uh, we could start with that. Um, it looks like uh, somebody says that uh, Calco's Soda Pop Stop in Highland Park in LA sells Schlitz, if that's what you're into. Um, so anyway, I wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, this is a, a free webinar because we wanted as many people as possible to participate, uh, but you're welcome to donate, of course. And that would be at californiapreservation.org slash donate. Uh, we also have a full day of conference sessions tomorrow, starting at nine o'clock. Uh, we have a lunchtime um, lecture by Julian Polanco, who's California State Historic Preservation Officer. And at five o'clock tomorrow night Pacific, we have Tiki time. And I'm gonna be co-hosting that with Trader Brandon. And we'll be featuring a private tour of Kirk uh, Thatcher's uh, own Tiki room. And he's a creature creator for ILM and he worked on Star Wars. And also, we're going to be talking to Christopher Plank and also Diane Kane, two historians who are going to go into the background of Tiki. And we'll be concluding that night with some time with Charles Phoenix, the ambassador of Americana, who will be showing, showing us some of his own Tiki artifacts. So I'd like to get right into the program. I wanted to introduce and thank uh, William Berg, who is author of many books on Sacramento. William, you want to take it? I'll take it. And I lost it. Wait, I need to share the screen. I should be experiencing preservation tales from Wicked Sacramento. As mentioned, my name is William Berg. I've written seven books about Sacramento, but I'm also a preservationist. I'm currently the president of Preservation Sacramento, which longtime Sacramentans may know better as Sacramento Old City Association, which has been around since 1972. I'm also currently the president of the board of directors of Sacramento Heritage, which has been around almost as long, and my day job is over for California's Office of Historic Preservation 
in the registration unit. And my latest book, Wicked Sacramento, talks about Sacramento's lost neighborhood, the West End, which has mostly disappeared. But there are a few buildings uh, uh, that I discuss in the book or uh, people associated with those buildings that do exist. And so I wanted to connect all of the stories that I tell today with locations that had some kind of preservation connection or were involved in a preservation battle as well as the battles that were surprising and unexpected and almost unknown in the city of Sacramento. This is a neighborhood that people don't know about because it physically doesn't exist. It was demolished very thoroughly, but it also was in many cases cleansed from public memory. People don't know about it, isn't talked about, and even where it is is often a mystery. People will also assume that old Sacramento is what we're talking about, but old Sacramento is a very small portion of a much larger neighborhood. Now, the politics of the West End and redevelopment were very tied in with the politics of race, as the political cartoon on the left of the Sacramento Bee shows that uh, blight was a, a term that was taken from biology, but it really describes neighborhoods that are not necessarily slums under the formal definition, but were likely to become slums principally because of the racial makeup of those neighborhoods. And on the right, uh, those of you who study the history of redevelopment and uh, and urban history will recognize as a redlining map. These red areas here are areas where you just can't get a loan at all, but, and pr principally these because these are neighborhoods of color. And the West End was a multiracial, multi-ethnic neighborhood. It was where Sacramento's Chinese, Japanese, African-American, Latino, Filipino communities were, as well as uh, ethnic white communities. We'll talk about all, more of those. But this area here, where it says D4, this is the West End. And at the opening of my book, the first decade of the 20th century, it was called the Tenderloin. Somewhat like the Tenderloin in San Francisco, both of which were named after the Tenderloin in New York City. And these were zones of essentially tolerated legal sex work that were found all over the country in the late 19th or early 20th century, whether the levee in Chicago, Hell's Half Acre in Los Angeles, Storyville in New Orleans, or the Tenderloins of Sac Sacramento and San Francisco. This is Second Street, part of Old Sacramento today, but Second Street and L Street were the principal alignments of the Tenderloin. And there were a variety of venues, and often the boundaries of different types of employment, whether it was dance uh, as a, in a chorus line or striptease or burlesque dancers and prostitution were blurred and people would often move back and forth between them based on their opportunities. And there were different categories of places. This is a building that still survives in old Sacramento, a, a major preservation battle of Sacramento in the 50s and 60s. And this was the location of the Opera Dance Hall on K Street between Front and Second Street. The Opera Dance Hall and Art Dance Hall were fairly legendary as notorious dens of vice and sin in the early 20th century, and they were known for having sinful music and uh, strange contortions performed by people dancing the turkey trots or the bunny hug or the grizzly bear, but they also had booths around the perimeter of the club with curtains. They were generally booths about six feet high. It could be closed for privacy for a semi-private sexual encounter right in the middle of the club. And there's so much music and noise and carrying on that you wouldn't be too noticed too dramatically. And this was more of a working class establishment as this was very much a working class neighborhood. It was an industrial neighborhood, a lot of heavy industry, the Southern Pacific shops and the waterfront were right there. And so that was a working man's place. And it was into this world that a woman who called herself Cherry to St. Maurice arrived in 1903 with a traveling production of a play called Floridora. She was a dancing girl and she got employment at Fanny Brown's brothel. Uh, it was a, 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 a middle class establishment on Second Street and worked there for about four years. And now this is a woman, we don't know really anything much about her, her life before her arrival in Sacramento other than she was probably from the Midwest and most likely left a family behind or uh, other 
relationships and possibly a child, but she was a skilled entrepreneur because within four years, by 1907, she had enough to purchase her own place. And that was her first nightclub at the corner of L and Third Street, and she named it the Cherry Club. Now, the Cherry Club was not a parlor house. It was not a big dance hall like the art or the casino. It was an elegant, large building that you can see here behind this uh, rather substantial fence. And the parlor house was aimed at an upper class establishment in Sacramento that would be business people and legislators. Where this, we were the, the center of government. This is just a few blocks of the Capitol. And so this, these were the the market that she was trying to reach. In addition to the obvious entertainments upstairs, she also had live music. Instead of a, a rowd, rowdy raucous band, she, she hired a talented, beautiful young pianist. And she was also known for her library. Uh, this was a woman who could discuss the current events of the day as well as the classics and even engineering and science. And often these were the discussions that happened downstairs while the obvious uh, business of sexuality was taking place upstairs. That's what a parlor house was. And, and Cherry re very rapidly became known as the queen of the Sacramento Tenderloin and, and made quite a bit of money. That, like I said, most of her life was a mystery of the fact that she probably was, came from the Midwest, from, from Illinois or Wisconsin, possibly got her start in this career in the, the levee in Chicago, but we don't know for sure. She was very secretive about her past. Even on the census form, she said that she was born in mid-Atlantic on a cruise ship between France and the United States. Uh, one thing we do know about her is she had this life-sized doll of a child, which she would often cradle like a, a human child with great sadness, leading many to assume that she had left a child behind in her previous life when she re rebirthed herself as Cherry de St. Maurice and arrived in Sacramento to start her business. And her bedroom chamber here was very elegant with the highest style and most expensive furnishings, as was the rest of the club. She wanted to show off her success and she actually, the place was robbed several times, sometimes by former, former employees or just people who wanted to break in to, to, to take her money because she became an obvious target of the underworld. Now, because this was a tolerated activity, you could call the police and have the police come and try to save your business. Now, another aspect of the early 1900s, this was the progressive era, and it was a part of a larger social movement, predominantly a middle-class movement, in order to uh, stamp out corruption, and, and in addition to other uh, objectives, such as uh, stamping out liquor, and uh, political corruption and business monopolies and the beginnings of the environmental movement. Uh, now that's Hiram Johnson right there, governor of California. And of course his office was just a few blocks away. One of the other things that the, the progressives wanted to do was, was eliminate this legal toleration of prostitution. So Cherry would occasionally stomp down the street from her place to Hiram's place and berate him because the legislators of California were in her club at night and then trying to ban prostitution during the day. And these hypocrites, she simply would not tolerate. And I don't think that Hiram Johnson had much tolerance for her, but he kind of had to put up with it because she was the most powerful woman in that part of the city. Now her business success was such that it, she wasn't just limited to the Cherry Club. She also made investments in the new suburb of North Sacramento and also to a suburban development in South Lake Tahoe. She had another venue that she purchased outside of Sacramento city limits called Oak Hall, which is down Riverside Road. There's actually a bend in the Sacramento River called Oak Hall Bend to this day, and that's roughly where Oak Hall was. That also got her into a business and sexual relationship with a man named John Francisco, who's also an abusive relationship. He, physically beat her at least once and uh, was arrested for it and the charges dropped as the nature of uh, uh, an abusive relationship. But that also ended up in a legal battle when he accused her of embezzling funds from Oak Hall, which became a, a rather complex court case. And that legal fight was never settled because on July 8th, 1913, Cherry didn't leave her room. 
until well into the afternoon. And this wasn't necessarily unknown of her, but one of her employees, Cleo Sterling, climbed around to see in her window and saw her laying on the floor in her bedroom, naked and obviously dead. She had been murdered in her own bedroom and robbed. There was uh, signs of a struggle. The only clue was a bit of rubber tape underneath her and uh, a lot of the jewelry in her room had been stolen, obviously by someone in a hurry. And this, you can see the, the background here, the, this, this massive crowd in front of the Cherry Club because Jerry de St. Maurice, again, one of the best known women in the city. And so her murder drew a, a crowd. And you can see in the background, that's the, uh, the tower of Weinstock Lubin's department store. So this was very close to Sacramento's, the, the core of the, the Sacramento business community as well. So shows that the close connection of a, a very elegant uh, parlor house and its connection to the business heart of the city of Sacramento. The mystery continued in the coming weeks. There were occasional, there were suspects, uh, including uh, actually the, some of the police actually suspected a Japanese American employee, uh, but not only because another Japanese American employee of the Cherry Club had tried to rob the place in 1911, but because they assumed that the broken neck that she, her, her neck had been had been smashed uh, was the result of jujitsu manipulations, the, the only martial art that people in California were familiar with at that point. So they assumed that the Japanese American employee must have been responsible. And also, several people started saying that they were Jerry de St. Maurice's heirs and that her wealth was theirs. She didn't, she didn't have any children, but they, they stood to inherit for various reasons. And in the, in the meantime, clues began to accumulate about who was responsible for the murder. And the principal suspect was a young musician by the name of Sam Raber. And Raber was a local musician and singer. He also did a drag act and uh, he was fired from a couple of jobs in to Sacramento because he was too insistent for tips. There were persistent rumors that he was an opiate addict and he disappeared the same day that Jerry died. He ran, he ran out of town along with his confederate, Jack Drumgoole. Now Jack Drumgoole was a boxer that Sam Raber had met in Reno the year before and brought to Sacramento with the intent of, of getting into prize fights. There are no registered fights in his, that, that he was involved with during this period. So we don't really know what Drumgool was doing during that year, but he and Raber obviously hit it off. They had an apartment together a few blocks away. And but over the time of the, of the, the, the investigation, they discovered that the tape found underneath Cherry's body was the same type that boxers used to wrap their, their fists before a match. So that was a clue connecting the two of them. Also, the first use of fingerprints by the Sacramento Police Department to identify a suspect that confirmed that Rayburn and Grumpel had been in the, her, her private quarters. The other party involved was Cleo Sterling. Now, this was the employee that actually saw Cleo's dead body, and she was Sam Rayburn's girlfriend. They were in a relationship up to that point. And three of them had a kind of a an informal gang robbing principally people that Cleo had lived with or worked for because she knew the inside of the building. The house where she had been raised as a, as an orphan, she and Raber and Drumgool had conspired to rob but weren't able to get in because the, uh, the key that they made to break in didn't work. So they hatched the plot to rob her employer, Cherry de St. Maurice. Now, Cleo stayed in town. Raber and Drumgool were arrested in San Diego and brought back to Sacramento to stay in trial. And the preservation part is a little was a little difficult because the Cherry Club is gone, and there's really not a whole lot connected with the life of Cherry de Saint Maurice. But there is one building recently rehabilitated, the American Cash Apartments, otherwise known as the Bellevue Apartments, on Eighth Street in Sacramento. This is where Raber and Drumgool lived. Sacramento Old City Association got involved with this project because a previous owner of the building wanted to demolish the entire half block and build a hotel, which was opposed. The city of Sacramento didn't really like the idea too much, and they got involved with a legal battle over uh, essentially wanting to take the entire half block along with an adjacent half block 
and turn it into a large redevelopment project just before the end of redevelopment. And this building kind of hung in limbo and the, uh, the other half of the block burned down in 2006. But we strategized because this building was designed by uh, a fairly significant architect and it's adjacent to a couple other buildings that are also old, potentially eligible, but at the time not listed and not necessarily in good shape. So we decided to concentrate our efforts on Save the Bellevue. It's a landmark, uh, and, and it, would, it actually was recently rehabbed. Now, in the, the fight against vice, there was a national law that was passed, the Mann Act. And this was about uh, banning, bringing women over state lines for immoral purposes. It was associated with the term white slavery, which uh, on the face of it is a very much racially charged term because it assumed that the slavery of prostitution was only an imposition to white women. That women of color were not necessarily considered protected. And also the uh, first person prosecuted under the Mann Act was Jack Johnson, the champion boxer. The second major prosecution were these two Sacramento men, Maury Diggs, an architect, and a uh, nephew of Senator Diggs, and Drew Caminetti, who was the son of Anthony Caminetti, uh, the commissioner of immigration and the former, former member of Congress. They took their two girlfriends to Reno. Uh, they were both married, by the way. And they were arrested and prosecuted under the Mann Act. Got relatively light sentences, but the man, or, um, Caminetti retired to his family's ranch in in Amador County and Maury Diggs continued his career as an architect in Oakland and the building that you see right here in the center this is the Thompson Diggs hardware warehouse at third and, and R Street and it is about the only surviving building from Sacramento's industrial waterfront that's still left in that part of the city interstate 5 runs here where you see these train tracks and then the to the right here is CalPERS building to the left is a parking lot so the Thompson Diggs warehouse and part of the architectural legacy of Maury Diggs still exists and currently it's, it's uh, offices, but it has real potential for other uses if CalPERS decides to actually use it for something. Mm, refreshment. Our next subject is known, who is known through the entire city of Sacramento. His name was Grant Cross, uh, another native of the land of Lincoln, uh, born in Illinois, who came to Sacramento via Red Bluff with his young wife, Rose. And he was well known in Sacramento as a, as a character, someone who is known for his, his community activism in the African-American community, but also his sense of humor. His employment was the various years was as a, a porter, as a waiter, as a bartender, but who's also at heart an activist. He was a member of the Republican Party during an era when that was the party of African-American rights. And he also became a member of the Progressive Party during the Progressive Movement. And um, here you see him towards the end of his life when he actually had uh, commandeered uh, jobs for the local African-American community in the shooting of a film called Cameo Kirby, which was a film set in the American South, but uh, on the Mississippi but filmed here in Sacramento because we're a lot closer to the Mississippi River. And his business partner was William Snow, a Texan. Uh, while Grant Cross was short and, and loud, William Snow was tall and quiet, a professional gambler, and had nerves of steel. At one point, he was the manager of a pool hall, and one of the customers began throwing pool cubes pool balls around the room and attacking people. He, he, the, the guy wound up to throw one at Snow, who pulled a revolver and shot him through the arm. And actually, this, that's the only photo we have of, him, is to, of his arrest. The fellow who was throwing the balls didn't press charges because it successfully diffused the situation. Now, Snow and Cross started a series of organizations in Sacramento. First, the Frederick Douglass Society, then the West End Club, which may be the source of the name, the neighborhood of the West End, and then later the Eureka Club. And these were all fraternal organizations for African-American men. And they were envisioned as parallels to Sacramento Sutter Club, which was its elite private club for business and, for rec and political activism, but also for recreation. One of their first headquarters was this building, Sarah Hall at 6th and L Street. And 
they function both as a political organization and uh, organizing for the rights of African Americans, but they were also a recreational organization. They held dances and live music. And this social hall, Sarah Hall, as you can see where it says Yugoslav here, this was a gathering place for Sacramento's Yugoslavian community, as well as African American community. And Yugoslavs, like other Southern and Eastern Europeans during that era, Italians, Portuguese, Greeks, were not necessarily considered whites in the, the sense that someone from, from England or France or Germany was considered white in early 20th century America. However, you could very quickly become white if you were a woman and entered a black owned nightclub. And so that, that's one thing that made Sarah Hall a bit notorious because the, that happened a lot. It also happened at the Churchill Dance Hall at Fifth and M Street, which is owned by J.C. Churchill, who's a white band leader who became the new host for the West End Club during this era. And in 1914, they held one of their best known political events where they invited all of the candidates for public office in July 1914 to the Churchill, which uh, the article about it is horrendously racist. And, and it talks about how, what, a, what a joke it was that this club is trying to convince political leaders to listen to them. But there's a real political reason why this meeting took place. The Churchill Dance Hall was also the polling place for the West End and the Women's Christian Temperance Union were trying to close it down, which meant effectively that in order for residents of the West End to vote, including its African American population, they would have to go to a white neighborhood where they were most definitely not welcomed by the residents of the neighborhood in order to carry out their civic duty. So this is a group that's fighting for their rights. and. Uh, also, their right to party, because they did hold parties. They found another location after the Churchill Hall. On the left here, you see the Nippon Theater. This is taken after the 20s, so you see as the talkies here. This is, if you, you recognize these ballers here, this is directly across the street from the Cherry Club at 4th and L Street. This is a, a couple of years later. The Cherry Club continued uh, either as a boarding house or, a house or as a brothel, depending on the year. But the Japanese-owned movie theater in Nepal had an upstairs recreation boarding area, and that became the later home of what by then was called the Eureka Club, and that was the home to the club until about 1940. And so this was a long-lasting civic organization that took root in the West End, and they became, even after Cross and Snow died, the people that they brought on the club continued its life for decades later. And so they had a really significant effect on the community and were even a, a lasting part of the jazz scene in Sacramento. They brought this new music to Sacramento. The only surviving building that I've been able to find directly associated with the life of the West End Club was Grant and Rose Cross's home at 909 22nd Street. It's a very modest little cottage. It probably was recognized as being an older building but not necessarily an individual landmark. But because of its association with one of the early 20th century Sacramento's most significant individuals, it's one that definitely could be eligible. And the city of Sacramento, this preservation department is currently undergoing looking at what are some places associated with underrepresented individuals, not necessarily for their the, the architectural prominence, but for their association with a person who otherwise there's no physical connection, there's no place. But there's one place in the case of Grant Cross, and that's this building right here. And so this is more of a future preservation struggle, but hopefully we're, we're going to be resolved in the coming years as the stories of the West End begin to emerge and people know about this and want to understand what it means. Now, I mentioned that theater, the Nippon. Uh, this was opened in 1908 by Yusuke Nishio, who was born in 1877 in Kanbara province, Japan. He moved from San Francisco to Sacramento after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco and opened not only this movie theater, but in 1923, the Wakano Ura Chinese or restaurant. Now, he's Japanese. He opens a restaurant that initially is Chinese and hires a Chinese cook. And that's because Americans were not familiar with Japanese food, but Chinese food was very popular. And so by providing a Chinese cook and a Chinese menu, but also a Japanese menu, he was able to introduce Japanese food into the dietary milieu of California. And because both Japanese and Chinese food, when they made the local ingredients, 
local items as, as necessary to meet American tastes as well as available ingredients, this became dietary jazz. This was a new fusion and new food of a creative person. There were other needs because this was the depression. And so the Wakano Ura restaurant also served sake if you knew who to ask for it. This was manufactured in the Delta in rice farms that were Japanese owned and they'd ship it up to Sacramento and to get it, it was kept in their basement to get it to the restaurant Instead of Mr. Nishio, he had his wife, now Nishio, carry it in a baby carriage from their home to the restaurant. And one day, Nao and her daughter Sakaye were carrying the baby carriage full of sake bottles up over a curb, and it, she got stuck and couldn't get the the baby carriage over the cart. Now there was a police officer about half a block away and saw them and came over to help. And little Sakai said, oh my gosh, the jig is up. We're going to jail for smuggling sake. The officer came over, helped lift the baby carriage onto the sidewalk as it was making very unbaby-like and very sake-like noises, uh, tipped his hat and went on his way. He knew exactly what was in the baby carriage. He just was paid to not care. Now, the Nishio family sold the restaurant Okano Ura, but it survived which both with that Chinese and Japanese menu in a second location after internment uh, and then after internment, this building here on the left on 4th Street, which got this very distinctive neon sign. Now, this building as well was wiped out by redevelopment. I told you that the whole area of the West End pretty much was demolished, but the sign moved to new location for Japantown on 10th Street, and it's still there today. The restaurant closed in 2000, uh, about, about a decade ago, but the sign is still there, and hopefully there will be a future for that sign as part of the archives. And Sacramento's gotten much better recently about sign preservation and either putting it in the archives or even reusing it. Uh, as you've seen some of our, if any of you have been to Golden One Center, we've got some of our historic neon on display there, and there's more opportunities to talk about the history of a really unique and special place for which there's no physical sign. Now, the African-American community, uh, the, the, on one hand, you had folks like Grant Cross, who were uh, gamblers and, and, and partiers, but then the Reverend T. Allen Harvey was a much more upstanding and formal citizen. He arrived in Sacramento in 1916 from San Jose and helped start a new church. Uh, he preached at St. Andrew's AME, but he started the, a new AME Zion church, and also founded Sacramento's branch of the NAACP. He also won the first anti-discrimination lawsuit in 1918 because he was refused service at the Bigelow restaurant in Oak Park. Now, Oak Park was a suburb of Sacramento outside the West End, but it's the, only, it's the one where African Americans could buy property because it was built before racial exclusion covenants. He was also the first African American to run for office in Sacramento, running for a city commission in 1919. And then when we adopted a new uh, council manager uh, city charter in 1920, he ran for council in 21. He lost both races, but he didn't come in last. And that was really one thing that proves, that proves that an African-American was a viable candidate. He was also a veteran of the Spanish-American War. And in 1917, he gave a keynote speech to African-American soldiers who were heading off to World War I. And then in 1919, he started a new organization, the Christmas Addicts Soldiers and Sailors Club. Now, the summer of 1919, was called the Red Summer. There was a dramatic increase in race-based attacks and lynchings. And so the Crispus Attic Soldiers and Sailor Club was a defensive reaction by the African-American community who said, we might have to fight for our lives here. In the wake of the Civil War, there were African-American militias here in Sacramento and elsewhere. Uh, in the case of Sacramento, the Sacramento Zoos, but there were others throughout California. And think of these as the Black Panthers 50 and 100 years before, ready to defend the, the, their lives and the, the lives of those in their community by armed force if necessary. That's the kind of values that Reverend T. Allen Harvey espoused. Now, his original church isn't there. His home isn't there, so far as I know. The Bigelow restaurant isn't there, but there is an edifice. It was actually a mid-century church, Kyle's Temple AME Zion, the church that he founded. And after his death, this mid-century building was built in 1956. The architect was Watson Cox, 
and we don't know for sure, but the firm that Watson Cox worked for was also one where, uh, where they, they received a lot of input on Sacramento projects from James Dodd, who built, uh, and who had been the architect of record for another African-American mid-century church in Oak Park, the uh, Shiloh Baptist Church. And so he really consulted on this. This Kyle's Temple, as, uh, like Shiloh Baptist, is, are both uh, city landmarks. Shiloh Baptist is listed in the National Register. Kyle's Temple, I don't think the National Register nomination has, has been submitted, but it's a, an eligible resource associated with the legacy of Reverend T. Allen Hardy. And very often, the, the closest thing we have is a place that was built in that person's honor and it carries on the legacy of their name. Another African-American Oak Park business person, a person to note, was George Dunlap. He was a, a, na a native Sacramentan, and from a young age, he started cooking for his household, had to drop out of school and cook, and he became a very talented chef. He also worked for a Chinese produce market, so he got a taste, he got a, a lot of skill very early in life for organizing a menu, and so he went into the restaurant business, and this was a later restaurant that he ran inside the Capitol Hotel at 7th and K Street. You can see the hotel plate in the background. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But George Dunlap got most of his experience doing short order cooking and in some cases specialty cooking working for Southern Pacific Railroad. Southern Pacific's major facility, the Southern Pacific shops, uh, the Sacramento Locomotives Works were here. And he worked not only in dining cars, but also in private cars for Southern Pacific executives. And in 1919, he was working on a private car, which ran between Washington and California. And in that summer, he was arrested for, in conjunction with the Mazuki Brothers liquor business here in California, for smuggling whiskey. And that's where the whiskey comes in, and, and our, our, our triad of beverages, from California to Washington. Because Washington at the time, in 1919, had adopted a state law against alcohol. They were a dry state. California was not. And the, the only reason he was able to slip the the charge is because the, when it was filed, they said that he'd smuggled alcohol into the state of Oregon, which wasn't illegal. So he, he wasn't actually prosecuted uh, or go to jail for this, but he did lose his employment at Southern Pacific. I don't know specifically whether they fired him for it, but this happened in the summer of 1919. And we do know that he left Southern Pacific's employment in July 1919 but he wasn't gonna let that stop him. There's a state, there's a saying among railroaders in California that if you get fired from Southern Pacific, you work for Western Pacific. If you get fired from Western Pacific, you work for Sacramento Northern. Sacramento Northern was an electric railroad that ran from Chico to Sacramento to Oakland. And the, they had a variety of business cars of their own, and observation cars like the Bidwell, the Alabama, and those of you from Southern California may recognize that that was Henry Hunt's private car before it was sold to Sacramento Northern tragically destroyed when a toaster short-circuited the Moraga and uh, the the ferry boat Ramon and he had the contract to provide food service throughout the Sacramento Northern system until it was taken over by Western Pacific who wrote some probably fabricated review bad reviews uh, I think bad Yelp reviews 1920s style of his uh, dining car service in order to get Western Pacific cooks in instead of Mr. Dunlap, uh, he was not gonna let that stop him. He had been a resident of Oak Park since 1907. He built uh, the house for his family. And he said, well, I have a house and I have these lovely daughters and this is gonna be my restaurant, Dunlap's Dining Room. Dunlap's Dining Room became one of the best known and most respected culinary institutions of Sacramento in the mid 20th century. It was, I will be sure to say, segregated. They had principally white customers, except one night a week when African-American customers were welcome to dine. But he adapted to his circumstances, like Yusuke Nishio serving Chinese food in a Japanese restaurant. He said, there are economic realities I need to meet here. And I, can, I can't beat the system, but I can find ways around it so I can succeed and my family can flourish. The house still exists. It is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It wasn't until recently a daycare, and I think right now, well, until recently it was an Airbnb. But the building's still there, and it's still part of Sacramento's 
architectural legacy can principally for its association with a significant individual. Next, we're going to talk about yet another product of the state of Illinois, Ansel Hoffman. Uh, he was a, a young lad who was born in 1884, and he and his family moved to Sacramento in 1890. He, he showed a lot of initiative from an early age. He would actually, with, with his friend Callahan, would grab chunks of ice that were discarded from refrigerator cars at the Southern, Southern Pacific shops and sell them to local bars as ice to cool people's beverages. And they, they offered a great deal until they found out where the ice came from. And he was not tall. He was about five foot one, 110 pounds soaking wet. So he had to learn how to fight at a young age, and he later became a boxer. But in the interim, uh, when he was a young boy, there was a women's baseball team, kind of an exhibition team called the Boston Bloomer Curls that toured through Sacramento. Then later, uh, when he was 21, at age in 1905, they, he had, with his father, had moved to Oklahoma, and the Boston Bloomer Curls came through, and they needed an equipment manager, and Ansel was the perfect candidate. And at one point, the third base player got sick. Ansel, being only five foot one and 110 pounds, as I said, was fairly easy to disguise by using, putting him in bloomers and a red wig as a female member of the Bloomer Girls. And so he played baseball and drag, and so at least for a while. And uh, this was, again, this was someone who took the initiative and opportunities where he could. And uh, when he came back to Oklahoma, he said, you know, dad, should I stay here in Oklahoma or where should I go to, to make a fortune? And his dad said, you should go back to Sacramento. That's kind of an interesting town. There's a lot of opportunity. So he did. And he opened up a number of bars and restaurants, starting with the Hoffman Saloon in 1906. And then in 1910, the Schlitz Cafe. Well, there's the Schlitz. He gave him, giving some credence to his, his Midwestern roots by offering Schlitz beer. And someone asked, well, would uh, Roostaller be an acceptable substitute? Well, yes. When the Schlitz Cafe couldn't get a supply of Schlitz, they would make use of products from the Buffalo Brewery like Gilt Edge or Roostaller or their eponymous Buffalo Beer. And they also had a place called the Hawkbrow at 514 K Street that, was, that Ansel owned. And during World War I, he renamed it the All-American Cafe because being German was not popular, obviously, during World War I. And as a white European, you could very easy, sh easily shed that cultural association by a name change. And reinforce the Americanism of your restaurant by abandoning race. And it was also a place where jazz was very early heard in Sacramento. Now, Grant Cross and William Snow brought African American music that was most likely a precursor to jazz, but it uh, really didn't get that name until the 19 teens. Uh, now, Ansel Hoffman was a boxer, but he also managed boxers. And this is. George Washington Lee, born in 1900, moved to Sacramento in, in 1906 after the earthquake, his family come here, came here. And he became a boxer at age 18. And he, like Ansel, was not a tall fellow. He was about five foot two, 115 or so pounds. And he was the first fighter that Ansel Hoffman managed, better, been, better known later for managing Max and Buddy Bear. But George Washington Lee, what he lacked in stature, he made up for in heart. Legendary boxer, Gentleman Jim Corbett, wrote about him and his fighting spirit. He didn't have the best record as a fighter because he tended to try to, to, to challenge people above his weight class. And plenty of white European boxers stepped into the ring with him, assumed I'm going to get up the floor with him, and they absolutely got their clock cleaned. Uh, he... Also, it was, this was a little bit of a risk for Ansel Hoffman because uh, a Japanese or Chinese fighter in this era was considered a novelty. And he, to some extent, would have, uh, Ansel even played into that for a while. He had him wear a, a pigtail, a traditional Chinese dress, but George didn't really care for that. For starters, he was half Chinese, half Mexican. He was proud of his, of his Mexican heritage, his Chinese heritage. And so the photo that you saw was of him in traditional boxing garb. He toured internationally with Ansel and actually needed to have this note written by the mayor of Sacramento to get permission to re-enter the country after he left because of bans on Chinese immigration. He didn't want to get mistaken for an immigrant when he was born in the United States. In 1924, he fought Francisco Galeto for the bantamweight championship of the world. He had fought him while he was on that, that tour of Asia 
but the 1924 match took place in Sacramento. In addition to the, the bars and restaurants, the bars all had to close because of prohibition in the 1920s. But the other business that Ansel had gotten involved with is opening what was called the L Street Arena, located in the same building as the Art Dance Hall, one of the two dance halls I talked about in the very beginning. Well, this was a 2,000 seat capacity building. And apparently for the fight with Francisco Galeto, they sold 3,000 tickets to local Filipinos. Uh, Filipinos from all over California came to see this fight because they wanted to see the Francisco Galeto Filipino champion fight. Uh, now, George Washington Lee lost the match. Uh, this, the L Street Arena was located between 2nd and 3rd Street, which means it is gone. It was underneath Interstate 5, so there's no sign of that. And likewise, the, the All-American bar is underneath Sacramento's Golden One Center. And even the his first place at 18th and Capitol is replaced by the Arnold Brothers building, which is a Zocalo restaurant now. But the other one, the Schlitz Cafe at 708 K Street does still exist and is about to reopen as Devil May Care Ice Cream. Now the 700 block of K Street was called Sacramento's last redevelopment project. It was the last one that was actually entitled to receive tax increment financing and Preservation Sacramento's predecessor, Sacramento Old City Association, was involved with an effort to get this plan selected instead of one that was a much more facadist approach that would have at most kept a couple feet at the front of the buildings. And what happened is that a mixed income building, so some affordable, some market rate, was built on the alley side, demolishing the back of portions of some of the buildings. But the vast majority of the historic fabric was retained and the fronts of the buildings, the, the front 90 feet, have all been restored, and most have new tenants, including Devil May Care and uh, places like Solomon, uh, Solomon's Deli. And this also was the recipient of one of the first Mills Act contracts of Sacramento's newly reinvigorated Mills Act program. So it's definitely a preservation success story as well as an affordable housing success story, and one of the handful of places directly associated with Ansel Hawk. Uh, another proud legacy uh, is uh, Sarah Clayton. Now, Sarah Clayton is one of the city's most amazing women uh, in terms of the scope of her authority, her intellectual prowess. And uh, this is a woman who could have run for mayor if not for the fact that she died in 1911, which is the year that women got the right to vote in California. Now, she and her husband, Marion Clayton, who was a surgeon during the Civil War, were involved with what was called the Sanitary Commission, which in the mid 19th century was involved, was trying to promote the idea of using water and soap and fresh air in order to limit disease, in order to prevent infection, and using the techniques that they had developed in the early 20th century that were put into practice during the Civil War in field hospitals and recovery hospitals and then carried out in action in places like Sacramento, where they opened at 7th and L Street, the Pacific Water Cure, which was, it was called a sanitarium, but uh, visions of, of rubber rooms, let the, cast them out of your mind, because what they meant by a sanitarium was more like what we'd call a health spa. And they would use baths and mineral baths and heating baths in order to promote good health. And uh, other ideas of 19th century health that, that were uh, based very very often on what was called the miasmic theory of disease. They didn't know too much about microbiology at that point, and they certainly hadn't been able to spot viruses. But they assumed that, well, things smell bad, you get an infection from it. So if we put these aromatic trees in front of our buildings, then that'll help prevent infection. It also has other effects like passive, passive cooling and limiting the effects of Sacramento summers by creating shade. Now, Mrs. Clayton was also involved with other efforts, such as the effort to move the county hospital from 10th and L Street, close to the heart of downtown, to a spot on Old Stockton Road, a couple of miles from downtown, which is currently the location of UC Davis Medical Center. She was also influential in starting orphanages and hospitals, and they're always promoting this idea of the Sanitary Commission, of sanitation, of health, through hygiene, through civic improvement, and occasionally by escape from downtown in order to be in a more helpful rural atmosphere, which you can see they're, they're filling with smoke. But 
again, this was, this was a, a woman who was very much on the cutting edge of medical ideas, as well as in some cases, urban ideas uh, for her era. And after her death, her daughter, Hetty, built a hotel at the former site of the spa called the Clayton Hotel. It was real, later renamed the Marshall Hotel, but this is a building that the, the portions of it are still there today. And Preservation Sacramento, when we were transitioning from Sacramento City Association to Preservation Sacramento, got involved with a development project because you, there's also this, this building here to the right, the new Clayton, uh, sometimes called the J Departments or Frank's Apartments in this photo, which was an apartment building adjacent to the, the Hotel Clayton. Built a few years later, and not necessarily quite as architecturally recognizable, but the, the, the Clayton slash Marshall was a city landmark. And the, the new Clayton, Frank's Apartments, or J Departments was not. And so they, it was a, a residential hotel occupied principally by very low income individuals, seniors, and, and the disabled. Then on the ground floor, was the Clayton Club. And this was owned by Al Oxman, who was an absolute nut for jazz, as well as early tiki culture. And it was before, really before uh, the tiki revolution, kind of the islands culture, which it really took root. But some of the greatest legends of jazz, like Billie Holiday and Cab Calloway, as you can see here, performed at the Clayton Club, which is this little hole in the wall nightclub. But he got some amazing stars in. And he also occasionally got into legal trouble. The, you can see the, the story of Cherry Lee, a different Cherry than Cherry of St. Grace, obviously, who was arrested because, uh, well, when she was arrested for lewd and indecent dancing, apparently the costume that she wore was small enough where it fit neatly into a small envelope. And uh, there were other instances where uh, what were called B-girls, which is a, a young woman who agrees to sit and pretend to be interested in what a man has to say in return for you buying her very expensive drinks which are usually tea that looks like a mixed drink, and then she gets to keep half the money, which was an illegal practice. And so that closed the Clayton Club. But the proposal for this building was a, a facadist re redo, which would entirely destroy the Clayton, or uh, the, the new Clayton, the J Departments, and then leave really nothing of the original building except the exterior walls. And we weren't really convinced that a facadist approach was justified, as well as the loss of low-income SRO housing. Now, the, there was a new building that uh, some of the that was that replaced the housing of the the, the Marshall in terms of a new SRO hotel, effectively at Seventh and H Street. But it was still felt like a loss, and so we weighed our options and even gave some consider consideration that uh, making it a big fight because there were some weaknesses with the environmental impact report. But we decided it was one that we would let slide because we, at the very least the, there was a new project for the residents to move to. And because one part of one of the mitigations that was offered was to include interpretation of local African-American history and local jazz history in potentially a new Clayton Club in the new building. Now that project took a while to get started because of the recession. And in the meantime, in 2016, a group of local artists occupied the building and did a temporary installation called the Art Hotel, where in, within the, the Jade, every room was occupied by a different artist and created a new artistic environment. And then we, Preservation Sacramento, as well as Sacramento Historical Society and Sacramento Heritage, were able to occupy the lobby of the Hotel Marshall and tell the story of Sacramento's West End through interpretive displays and through live music. We did, did all sorts of events there, film festivals and poetry readings, live music, and even a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Dada movement. And it really also started discussion about reuse of historic buildings. What a shame that we were losing this building that not only was such great art, but also was if in very much in need of repair and rehab, but potentially useful housing. Uh, unfortunately, that dialogue ended with the demolition of the building and the hotel is under construction. Uh, but I think it, I like to think in the long term, number one, we're still hopefully going to get a, a Clayton Club and some interpretive information. 
And these were buildings that were built as luxury hotels that turned into residential hotels later. And uh, perhaps 50 years or a century from now, the luxury hotel will be a residential hotel again, should need arise in downtown Sacramento for that market. Our final story is about a gentleman named Felix Flowers who came to Sacramento. He we worked in the state printing plant for a while, but he also uh, wanted to be a restaurateur. So he built his own restaurant, the Flower Garden at 4th and O Street. It was designed by Roy Sweden and built by A.E. Kimmel. And it was intended to serve two functions, both as a Southern food restaurant and as an Elks Club for African-American Elks, because the Elks building on J Street in Sacramento would not permit African-American Elks to meet there to the point where they actually, where there was a, a statewide meeting of Black Elks here in Sacramento and they met in the Masonic Hall next door to the Elks Hall. And so his response was rather than grin and bear it, so I'm gonna find my own solution. So we built a restaurant that also had a fraternal hall built in, in the, in the side of the building, as well as being a fairly innovative restaurant. A, um, the woman who I interviewed who'd grown up in Sacramento's Japantown, adjacent to this neighborhood, said it was the first place she'd ever had a mint julep. They also uh, had a delivery, which is kind of an unusual feature in 1954, motorcycle-based delivery of their food, and a upstairs second floor garden. The, the, the name Flower Garden was more than just a metaphor. They actually had a flower garden on the roof and, and also rooftop dining, as well as the floor level. Unfortunately, the, the restaurant ended up not being economically viable because the demolition and redevelopment of the West End was just about to begin. And right behind this building, this was the Buddhist Church's Assembly Hall, which was the starting place for another organization, fraternal organization, and later uh, co-educational organization, the Nisei VFW chapter. Now, Sacramento's Nisei veterans of World War II came back and these uh, Japan American veterans, American heroes, and from various uh, units throughout the country, but primarily the, um, from the US Army, were not allowed, very much like the, like the, the, the Black Elks, were not allowed, allowed to join white VFW. So they said, we're going to start our own. And they started out in the Buddhist church's hall behind the, uh, the restaurant. And then it came up for sale. And so Sacramento's Japanese American Citizens League and this new VFW chapter bought the building. And it was then and is today Sacramento's Nisei War Memorial and the VFW chapter still meets there. There's also a small monument in front, which is about the only sign in downtown Sacramento that we ever had a Japantown or that we ever had a West End. This building is currently, a, a nomination has been submitted to list this building in the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, that's one of the things I've been very fortunate to work on in my day job, because this building is one of the few defiant survivors of the West End. And so if you, if you brought sake or a beer, Schlitz or, or a Roostaller or a, a shot of whiskey, here's where I'd like to drink a toast to the memory of the West End and the people and places that made it so special. May its memory return. And if you found that refreshing, I hope that you'll enjoy my books. Uh, I do want to mention the, the link here. The URL will take you to a local Sacramento bookstore called Capital Books. And if you order the book, either Wicked Sacramento or any of my books from them, then not only will you get the book, but uh, because it's here in town and I know the owner and we kind of made an arrangement, I will be happy to sign and even personalize it for you. And so. I hope that you'll purchase that. Now, all the, the royalties from this book go to Sacramento Center for Sacramento History. They're the city county archive. They, pro they provided many of the photos that I use for this book and others, and they're an enormously important resource to any historian who's doing any research, whether it's writing a history book or writing a nomination in Sacramento County. So I uh, hope that you'll buy my books, not only because it's fun to have people buy my books, but hopefully you'll enjoy them and that doing so supports a really worthy and worthwhile archive. And that's uh, the end of my presentation. So thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions.
Thanks, William. That was really great. I just posted the uh, link to the uh, book, uh, the Capital Books. I posted that in the chat so everybody can find that. And it was good to see that some of these buildings were actually uh, saved, which isn't always the story when we're talking about preservation. Um, we have one question, and I know, um, oh, someone has raised their hand. That's a John's area. He specializes in, in those for sure. Um, I had a question about, um, while um, John's um, teeing that up, I had a question for you. Uh, you've written a couple of books, and what is the prevailing theme? Is it wicked in every book, or what is the theme of all of your books put together? Well, my first book was about Sacramento's streetcar system. And I met a fellow named Al Belshore, and he told me, you've got to write a book about Southside, which was the neighborhood south of the West End, which for the most part is where a lot of the people who were kicked out of the West End went. And so I write about Sacramento's transit system, its railroad system, but it's about its underrepresented communities, communities of color, LGBTQ populations, transgender history, uh, music history, and then the stories of artists and musicians that started here or came here to be part of, of this community and, uh, and the, the political and social movements that were engendered by the wake of redevelopment. And I, it, I, I, never, I never get too far away from the West End because that's a, that's a legacy, like I said, that, that Sacramentans don't hear about. If you grow up here, what you learn is this, um, this guy came and started a fort, then uh, this guy discovered gold and these four guys built a railroad and nothing interesting has happened since 1869. And what I found is that's extraordinarily untrue. And uh, as we go on, there, there's a lot of history that's being uncovered and now I'm, I'm far from alone. And I've got a lot of great, there's a lot of great history that's coming out of this city and I'm proud to just be a part of it. Thank you. It looks like John has a special guest ready. We have a special guest here available. Uh, his name is Milford Wayne Donaldson. And his mic's not on. Ah, my mic's on, Bill. Hey, <laughs> that was really terrific. I, I got a question. Um, how much of West Sacramento, uh, because I know there was a lot of Japanese and others, if, if you remember, we're, we're going to have a, a mobile workshop that was going over there to uh, look at the first uh, California Indian uh, veterans uh, hall. And uh, how much of, of this stuff morphed over the river to West Sacramento? I ran out of, I always run out of room whenever I write, but I really wanted to include a chapter in Wicked called West of the West End about West Sacramento, because very often that's where uh, people were pushed. Uh, not only, uh, you mentioned the, the All Indian VFW Hall, it's a recently listed California historical landmark, which is located in West Sacramento, but also uh, Sacramento's gay and lesbian community. The, the, it was a, the earliest gay and lesbian clubs that we know about, or a, lot, a lot of gay clubs um, and a lot of gay organizing happened in West Sacramento, as well as Portuguese, Chinese communities, which uh, whose survivors really uh, very often were shifted to West Sacramento, as well as the South Side or other neighborhoods. Out, outside of the urban core. Yeah, I've been told there's lots of uh, e existing resources over there, but when you drive through it, you don't really see that. Is, is that so or not? The, it really, you, you kind of need to make the right turn. There's a lot of architectural heritage in West Sacramento, not only off of the I Street Bridge in the old town of Washington, but in, in Bright and Broderick, the, there's a lot of uh, cultural riches as well. Uh, there's a strong Latino community, that's there and it's very often expressed in the food community. There's some terrific restaurants in West Sacramento. And then there's also some great mid-century developments in West Sacramento and some industrial buildings. Uh, there's a, there are a certain number that have been rehabbed and reused. There's a great tax credit project right off the I Street Bridge in an old firehouse uh, done by the same people who did the 700 block K Street, by the way. But um, but there's really a lot of unidentified treasures in West Sac, and, and so that's a, a rich market. And hopefully the city of West Sacramento, currently I think they think of historic preservation as something to mitigate against uh, rather than to embrace, but I think that they could follow Sacramento's example and embrace their history more thoroughly by adopting an ordinance and doing a, a more complete survey of the parts of West Sacramento that are eligible because there's there's some great stories there, and I don't know enough of them yet to write a whole book yet. My last question, Bill, is how much influence was the River of Sacramento coming in from the Bay of San Francisco 
uh, where you uh, could basically be in rather large craft at that time have on the influence of West Sacramento and the, and the history that you have? Was it compared or comparable to other places like along the Mississippi or other places like this in terms of being a river town? Very much so. The, on the West Sacramento side, the, there was only a small bluff and that's where Washington was built. And that was really all there was at West Sacramento until we started building substantial levees. Now where the confluence of the Sacramento American rivers was, uh, is just north of the I Street Bridge. And there was a large sandbar that stuck out into the river because of the American entering the Sacramento. And so large ships couldn't navigate any farther north than Sacramento. So this became the de facto location because it's as far as you could get with a seafaring vessel. And only a smaller river craft could get any further north. So that really put a geographic limit on how far you could put a big city. And so sure enough, the biggest city in the Sacramento Valley happened right there where the, where the navigation stopped. Okay, and, and my very last, last <laughs> question, how much influence came from San Francisco by way, of this, by way of the river? Quite a bit. They were very closely connected. When Wells Fargo opened, their headquarters were in San Francisco, but the hub of all their stagecoaches was in Sacramento. The first railroad in the, on the west coast of the United States, the Sacramento Valley Railroad, was funded by San Francisco, but it ran from Sacramento to, um, to Folsom. And I mentioned that both cities had a tenderloin, both inspired by New York. Sacramento and San Francisco, in terms of the European-American inhabitants who came from the East Coast, were very much, they were populated overwhelmingly by those from the Northeast and from New York, to the point where there was a Sacramento accent that sounded very much like a New York accent. And San Franciscan, old-time San Franciscans may know about the existence of an accent called the Mission Brogue, which sounds like a Bronx accent. It's almost vanished. And the only place he found it was Sacramento and San Francisco. He also finds similarities in our built environment, the way the cities are built, versus Southern California, which had much more of a Southwestern and, Amer and influence from the American South, both in the geography, the way the cities were built, and even in some ways the level of sin. During the era we talked about, Southern California was considered kind of prim and proper because of that Southern and Midwestern population where the Northeasterners life, like within, in Sacramento and San Francisco, we liked it a little more rough and rowdy. Awesome, Bill, sweet histories, love it. Thank you for your questions, Wayne. Um, I have a few more questions as well coming through both Facebook and, um, uh, and our Q&A box. Um, so Kathleen is asking, who were the progressives of that era and how would you ca characterize them in their platform? I was thinking of the same thing, the temperance people, what, what, what was going on on the other side of the spectrum in terms of people trying to police these activities? Well, the progressives were, they were part of the Republican Party, which at the time was the, really in some ways a more liberal party in that it was, they were talking about women's rights and civil rights. Uh, but at, the, at this point, well, there were also other currents, a uh, growing amount of racism in the country and the growth of a movement called eugenics, which the progressives actively embraced, which uh, racialized and factionalized the Republican Party and the progressive movement to the point where there was even a split between what were called the black and tan faction of the Republicans, which were included African-American voters in the South and the lily whites, well, guess. And so th this was a middle class movement. Uh, rather than a working class movement, there were also there was also an American left at this time. The the IWW socialists, communists were were very much active on on the far left of the labor movement, and so this was not progressives in the sense you're talking about like democratic socialists of America today, but more I, I'd say more the kind of the the Hillary Clinton wing, the Democratic Party, kind of the, the conservative business Democrats, where they've got nominally a progressive social agenda but within, very much within the capitalist framework and very often some fairly questionable racial ideas. Okay, so somebody's asking, uh, um, it's Shafe actually, Shafe on Facebook is ac asking, uh, is the Churchill Club and Yugoslav Hall at the top of the stairs because of the Sac Delta flooding? That's a good question, I'm not sure. For, for certain, but it, w it wouldn't be surprising. Both of the buildings are from fairly early in Sacramento history when the deltas were wet or when, when the levees were not the best. And so the elevated level uh, may have been a, a flood measure, but elevated buildings are also useful in hot weather because they amplify stack effects. 
you can bring cool air from the basement up vertically through the building. So they, they serve several different purposes. I have a, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, uh, one of our uh, listeners are, is asking, where did you source your photographs from? And then I would also like to know in terms of sourcing, what archives proved to be most valuable to you in your research? Well, I mentioned the most important one, the Center for Sacramento History. And others it came from, the, there's actually, I found one uh, uh, for the, from the University of Wisconsin. I found uh, some were gathered. Uh, I was part of an effort to create a display at the California Museum of Sacramento's Japantown between internment and redevelopment. And so I was able to scan family photos from the Oye family and Sasaki family, a few others, and some of those photos made it into the book. But principally, Center for Sacramento History is the most important. And then the, they're, they're really the source that I use most often. And, and Sacramento also has great riches in terms of archives and photo collections. There's the California Archives, the California Library, and the Sacramento Room, the Sacramento Library, which also provides a lot of photos, CSH, and then the Sacramento State University Special Collections. Okay. okay. Do you so, got one, John? I do. I, I do have a question. Um, and, uh, and this one is kind of my question. So uh, maybe I'll ask it. Um, in your closing slides, you had uh, the, the potential sort of um, uses of uh, vacant or, or underutilized buildings. And you were talking a lot about building occupations and how to retake control of buildings. And as um. I'm curious about your thoughts on it as sort of a preservation strategy. Do you think it helps activate a structure and make it uh, enliven it? Or, and how long does that last? And what, what sort of steps do you take after that? I suppose the answer is it depends because the art hotel that we talked about and then later an event called Art Street, which was located in a warehouse a year after Art Hotel, which was also demolished. And these were temporary installations that were done principally because the buildings were intended for demolition, but they also were able to start dialogues about saving the building versus demolishing it. And in some cases, places that are sites of artistic creation later become adaptive reuse historic buildings. If any of the, uh, any uh, Sacramentans here are familiar with a bar called the Shady Lady on R Street, uh, a few blocks up from the Thompson Diggs warehouse, that was uh, originally a bakery, but in the 80s and 90s, it was a place where underground and semi-underground art happenings happened in Sacramento. And then now it's, it's both residential as well as having a, a row of very uh, artistic local businesses underneath. So the, the, the nice thing about those spaces of artistic creation, they're very often temporary. These are Hakeem Bay's temporary autonomous zones in physical form, but they suggest more permanent changes that can be made and starting with that inspiration uh, social movements like this they start with with a walk with a tour with a with a story and then when people are engaged in the story then they start saying well what can we do that is permanent how do we turn a story into an institution and in a more pragmatic sense how do we turn this potentially useful place into a place for people to live ideally affordably and places where they can work and connect in close proximity. And our historic neighborhoods and historic districts are the ideal starting point for that. Uh, Chris, it's your turn. Ah, my turn. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, William, that that actually uh, really goes back to um, something that we talked about yesterday during the conference which is about um, affordable housing, or that was actually our Don Ripkema and Adrian Scott Fine uh, discussion, I think, where they said that they found a study that said affordable housing was best um, accommodated in older structures because you, I think Don Ripkema said you can't build new and rent cheap was his uh, quote. Um, and you've been finding that in your studies as well, is uh, what you're saying? I mean, it, it's maybe it's anecdotal because it, the, the, whereas that's really the great thing about the study that LA Conservancy did is because it turned anecdotal information into evidence. And in Sacramento, lately, the, the, if a mid if a mid rise mixed use building is built, then it has retail on the ground floor and residential above. And what's happened is that the retail market is relatively soft, and new buildings are really expensive. So almost invariably, those ground floor retail spaces remain vacant for years. Whereas 
in the adaptive reuse of historic buildings. In part, maybe it's just because of the curation skills of the people doing the projects, but they open up with the ground floors ready for retail and they start getting inhabited and start getting popular even while people are moving in upstairs. So they're done on the same timetable. So that's it's really something that we do see. So obviously, there are moving parts and challenges that some developers don't like, but some see it as a challenge and, and, and pick up that challenge. And we some of the best affordable housing, places like the, the, the Bellevue, the, the, the home of the, the two murderers of Charity St. Maurice, that's 22 affordable units. It's all affordable. And so it, it's kind of rare, but um, it, it, when it's done right, it can be something that, that is a seed for future growth. A rehab historic building versus next to a vacant lot is a far preferable situation than a vacant historic building next to a vacant life lot. The, the, the latter is perceived as blight, the former as opportunity. Okay, I'm up um, and I saw a few questions come in, so it, it'll be tough for me to pick. Uh, there is a comment, uh, Pasadena is also looking to move away from ground floor retail since many units are empty. Um, I see the same here as well in a lot of places. Um, but the question I'm going to ask is, is a good percentage of Sacramento preserved? No. Right now, about 15% of the city has even been surveyed. We're a city of nearly 100 square miles. And so uh, the central city and a handful of spaces outside of it have been surveyed. A good chunk of the central city, specifically the neighborhoods of Richmond Grove and part of other neighborhoods are not listed historic districts, even though they're unquestionably eligible. And some of the city's best known architectural troves, uh, the fabulous 40s in East Sacramento or Land Park or Southland Park, these are there, there are no historic districts there. So I would say that there is ample opportunity for greater use of historic preservation, not been uh, as as many would accuse to freeze these neighborhoods in amber because that just doesn't happen mm -hmm. but the, the parts of our city that do have historic districts is mostly the central city and that is where the bulk of the new housing has been constructed over the course of the next of, of the past decade and there is no contradiction between growth and preservation when approached intelligently and managed wisely and uh, I, I really salute Adrian Steady and what, what they did there because that's that's proof you can drop on the table and say, look, this is what we can do. And so we've got the anecdotes and specific examples here in Sacramento. Now we have the numbers to back it up. Um, should I ask one or should should I move to you, Chris? No, you or, go. <laughs> are, we, are we doing this here? Um, first of all, I just wanted to show everybody what I'm having tonight. It's a- well, I'm all done. <laughs> Um, so my next question is um, in relation to some of the spaces that you featured in your presentation, one of which were uh, uh, boxing arenas. And um, my, my immediate question is um, some of these spaces, whether uh, because they were meant to be underground or out of view or because they were communal uh, spaces that um, in our modern area, era may no longer seem to want to serve a purpose even though we'd love, love them to how how um how, how do you uh activate or reuse spaces that were associated with this past of sacramento um in a way that is compatible with our modern times well there's a lot of similarities between our modern times and this era uh, there, there there's actually was and I think is a fad of speakeasies. Uh, one of the photos that I showed was of the um, the, the the Capitol Hotel at, at uh, 7th and, and K Street, where the, one of the early um, Dunlap restaurants was. That actually in the basement recently opens a place called Flat Stick Pub, which is an indoor miniature golf course. And don't tell anybody, but they have a secret speakeasy inside. Uh, and they, where the, they're, these are, this is a fad, and people, I think, they're, they are very much into this kind of story, even though it's not a historic building, it's a relatively modern building, but again, it, it kind of, it's a gateway drug. It gets people into talking about the stories and, and brings them into the idea of, ooh, old places are cool, old places are special, and they're kind of rare. And so the, that, it's really limited more by the imagination of the builder and the developer than anything 
anything else and of the, the community to suggest those changes. And while the, the, the arena that we talked about, the L Street Arena of Boxing was located in an alley and basically invisible from the street, this was a large facility. It was the, essentially, it was one of the largest gathering places in the city uh, equal in capacity to its largest theaters until the construction memorial auditorium. So often it, uh, it's, it's both hidden from view, but very well known. It's an open secret. And that kind of open secret is also the best kind of treasure. Because part of the joy of the city is the joy of the flamingo, the joy of discovery. You take a wrong turn, you discover this place you, that you, even though you'd lived there for years, you didn't know about. It. So that's really fun in any city. And Sacramento has always been ripe with that sort of thing. Well, now I'm sad that we didn't have our uh, our conference in Sacramento like we were supposed to, because then we could go on the tours. Uh, Maybe next year. Yeah, next year. I had a question, William. I'm wondering how you landed on this topic, but a lot of the buildings that you showed are uh, other people might argue are not architecturally distinguished, so you really have to argue twice as hard as we know for something like that. But how did you land on this and determine that this was the uh, topic that you wanted to pursue? Uh, kind of by accident. I, I was... Uh, I was uh, involved with a neighborhood association and I fell in with a bad crowd uh, that I mentioned Sacramento Old City Association. And I had some experience putting on music festivals. And so they said, hey, we want to do our historic home tour in your neighborhood and we need somebody to organize the street fair. And before I knew it, uh, I, I had already been involved with history from volunteering at the railroad museum. And um, there was a lot of common ground and a lot of some of the things that I just kind of had been going with instinctively. I, I moved to Sacramento to work with homeless mentally ill adults in transitional building in, trend, in a transitional program that was located in two historic four squares in Southside Park. So I had been in a, in a career housing people in historic places. And so I already knew that part of the potential, but what I didn't know is that connection with what's a, what's a historic building, what's not. And uh, whenever people say, well, architecturally distinct, well, there are four different criteria for eligibility in the National Register Association with events, with individuals, architecture, and archaeology. And so that architecturally distinct means, okay, it's not architecturally distinct. Doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean it's not special. Doesn't mean we can't learn from it. So look at all four. Right. I'd always say that you can't tell it's historic just by looking, used to be my thing. Yeah. <laughs> because half the buildings I would be defending would... Um, be not uh, something that most people would uh, want to preserve. Uh, we have a couple comments. Somebody said this would be a good topic for a workshop. So we could maybe consider that at some point. The, also, it's coming back around to this ground floor uh, retail, which is required by zoning code. And I've made the same observation that new buildings, the ground floor is empty for years and years, the commercial ground floor that has to be incorporated. What do you think is the real distinguishing element then between maybe an older building and a new building? Is it scale? It, it, you know, what do you think is that what makes the difference? Well, uh, 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 scale can be part of it because very often the, uh, in order to maintain maximum flexibility, the, the ground floors tend to be a huge floor plate. Whereas with older buildings, it tends to be small. And very often uh, using the Jane Jacobs dictum about new ideas need old buildings, very often a new idea is a compact idea, a small coffee shop, a small theater, a small bookstore, a small re record store. And that's the, one of the things we're seeing in Sacramento and I imagine in other places is a rebirth of record stores after they were, they were going away uh, because of the big box stores. But now guess what? We're in a new era and the uh, meteor hit the earth and the dinosaurs are dying, but the small and nimble small businesses that can locate in old buildings. You can't put a Walmart in the ground floor of, a, of a, a small building, but you can certainly put a record store there if the rent is cheap enough and the, the owner is imaginative enough. So that's, that's really the, the new environment that we're facing. And with what we're going through right now, who knows? But mm -hmm. the opportunity is, is still there. Our friend John English says, yes, more record stores, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. So um, I noticed another comment saying pedestrian experience. I hope they're not referring yeah. to the webinar today. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's just, uh, I, you know, I think it might also just be part of um, economics, as you're saying, William, it's that you can, uh, it's the same with the housing. You can rent out an older commercial um, space, maybe for less money. The new ones are maybe too expensive. 
Uh, some people are laughing on our chatting right now. Um, and so uh, Wayne Johnson had one more question. He get, says, do you know whether or not the diverse communities were active in preserving these buildings and communities in Western Sac Sacramento that you showed? Uh, in, uh, I don't, uh, there were efforts by the Japanese American community, uh, specifically by Henry Takeda and, the, and the, the Japanese community to try to limit demolition of the West End because this was a neighborhood that by the early 50s was already regenerating. New construction was going on. So they tried very hard to save their neighborhood, but they simply didn't have the political power. And sometimes you just can't fight city halls. Another lesson that if you're a preservationist and you've been in the game for a while, you know that you're just gonna lose some. So you have to negotiate, you have to strategize, you have to take into consideration What's a battle that we can win? Where can we draw our line in the sand? Where are we going to be able to get sympathy from the community, from the public to save a place versus uh, some places relatively unlovely? Sometimes you have to stand on principle and you're still going to lose because the, the, the battle on the principle is worth it. But it's always nice to win some too. And that can be a bit more of a challenge. It requires a bit more power and authority. And to be honest, uh, white middle class, those same people that were the maybe the the progressive a century ago is where a lot of the power and authority was. And so uh, I hopefully we, this is becoming a more diverse movement as, as we recognize the importance of more than just kind of the, the homes of, of rich white people. But how to get there is still a challenge. And uh, me as a white male, I don't know if I'm the best suited to answer that question by any means. Uh, I can mostly, I can shine a light on what I think is an injustice or what I think is important or what I think is fun and uh, let others carry the, carry the ball farther than that. John, you're still muted. There you go. I, I'm still <laughs> muted. I know, I know. It, ta it takes conscious effort, especially <laughs> after you've had a little bit of port. Uh, so uh, I did post a poll in our, um, in our discussion on Facebook and I, I wanted, uh, uh, everybody to know what the responses were. Most people had whiskey tonight. Um, so I know that's a very important question to ask. Uh, so I figured I'd relay it to everybody in the room. Um, and then uh, finally, um, I think we've got about three minutes left. So I, I wanted to um, open it up to our attendees again to see if we want to have any other special guests to share uh, either their um, where they are right now in zoom we can activate your video and show you um, if you're in Sacramento we'd love to see where you live um, but then also just if you have any additional questions um, and I see uh, Taylor is saying hooray for scotch whiskey um, it looks like did am I missing any questions Chris Nope, you got it, but I see one from Vivian. She's been on a couple of our sessions today. She's in uh, Boyle Heights, uh, which is oh. just outside of downtown Los Angeles. She says that they're also facing, um, uh, Boyle Heights will also be facing uh, what's important to preserve with many of the people who grew up there versus the newcomers who don't have a concept of the history of Boyle Heights. They're receiving support from many people and they'll hope that this continues as we receive more attention. As I mentioned in an earlier, uh, a session. My family comes from Boyle Heights. They come from the Gully. I don't know if you've heard of that, Vivian, but my dad grew up in the Gully with his nine brothers and sisters, and my grandparents came from uh, Mexico and moved to Los Angeles. So I can tell you that those buildings are not uh, architecturally distinguished, but are associated with many important people in the history of LA. Oh, somebody wants to hear about your cabin, John. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this cabin um, is built of Oregon Douglas fir, and I'm now in Oregon right now, um, sheltering in place uh, with my nice fire pit. Um, it, uh, it was my dad's place. So, um, yeah, it's just a nice, peaceful, uh, you know, considering all the circumstances in the world, I think it's the best place to be for me. Yeah, and we've been enjoying the bird song because John is actually outside, which is why he's wearing a jacket. <laughs> and I'm in Orlando, Florida in a 1959 A-frame. 
And that's William, we're you're starting in Sacramento, public, right? Yeah. We're starting to call ourselves the Cabin Preservation Foundation, right? Yes, yeah, Cabin Preservation Foundation, not California okay. Preservation Foundation. I did, did want to say hi to Boyle Heights. Is it, that's a pretty amazing neighborhood. It reminds me a lot in Sacramento. I mentioned Oak Park, and that is uh, also kind of the area that's facing a lot of similar pressure. It's just outside of downtown. It's where uh, that is where the African American community moved after redevelopment, and where, for example, the Black Panther Party got its start in Sacramento. And a few years ago, we did a walking tour of Oak Park with Black Lives Matter. And what we did is we made it into a shared authority, where we're talking about historic preservation and the past of the neighborhood. But we're also talking about the contemporary legacy of police brutality, and we're talking about. Uh, other other issues, rising rents and gentrification, which uh, uh, Boyle Heights, uh, I'm really impressed with the activism in the community there. It's very strong. And um, one of the, the challenges we have to face is the fact that, that very often what we do is going to be seen as intrusion if we're not in, if we're not an inclusive movement. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got to just we've got to just open those doors and hopefully uh, hopefully we will, whether it's in Oak Park or in Boyle Heights or throughout California. Yeah, th thank you for mentioning that, William. Earlier today, we had a session on the Japanese hospital in Boyle Heights, which faced an uphill battle in terms of getting um, listed and also just because of the owner objection and everything that they had the challenges that you often face in preservation. So that's the beauty of um, conferences like this is we all can learn from each other and um, figure out the best way to make things happen. Um, and it was really enlightening for me um, I'm sure it was for Chris as well to to hear about uh, Sacramento's uh, wicked past through the lens of preservation. Um, yes, so thank thanks so much, William. We should thank mention you. that all of these, uh, this session is being recorded. A couple of people have asked about that. It will be available on our Facebook. Uh, if you go to our Facebook feed, which is a CA Preservation, and you uh, click on video and you'll see it in one of the uh, archives. And we'll also be posting it to YouTube where you can find a lot of our free programs that we've had in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I think we needed to wrap up, right, John? Yeah, I'm going to have you be the person to ask people for money. Ah, okay, I will do that. Uh, first, I wanted to thank William for sharing all of your time and expertise. Uh, we really appreciated it. And um, I, we have shared the link uh, where people can go and buy your book. And I think you said that would be signed. Is that right, William? Yeah. Yeah, a signed book from William, if you go to the link that we posted in the chat. I just want to remind everybody that we still have one more day of the conference left and we'll be starting at nine in the morning. We have a special lunchtime presentation by Julianne Blanco, and then we're gonna be ending again at five o'clock. We have another happy hour, uh, Tiki time with uh, co-host Brandon, Trader Brandon, and also featuring Charles Phoenix. So John, we have a survey after, right? Yes, we have a survey. <laughs> and you haven't, you haven't yet you haven't yet asked people for money so oh, i forgot <laughs> <laughs> and please donate to cpf so the the url thank you for reminding me john uh, yeah. the url would be uh, californiapreservation.org slash donate and we appreciate all of your help we'd like to host a lot of these free programs to give back and and, and so we can all um, partake as a community and anything that you can donate is very much appreciated Thank you for thank you all for your support and thank you William for your time tonight. Thanks. We'll see you all tomorrow. Cheers. Cheers.